Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, we're gonna, Pete's going to be preaching from verses 1 to 10 tonight. Um, just as you're finding it, I just want to ask a, a very brave volunteer to just head to the back, uh, get the big poker stick, and just close those windows uh, so that those blinds are not going to... Uh, thank you, Paul. That's great. Thanks so much. That's great. Ephesians chapter 2, and we'll read verses uh, 1 to 10 together. The Apostle Paul writes, And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ, by grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Amen. Oh man, what a passage. And From Southern California, we, uh, there are still people who bow the knee to Christ in California. It wasn't just you and Gloria, um, but we love you guys. We, uh, so I was with you a year ago, and I remember going back home and saying, there's this great church on the world. My wife's like, what's the world? And uh, they praise the same king. And so when we were planning, I had a work trip in Madrid, and when we were planning out this road trip in England, I said, we have to stop. We have to worship with them. We have to stay with the Willises. And, and Hugh said, hey, would you preach for me? And I said, it'd be a pleasure. So thank you for this opportunity to open the word of God. But before we do that, let me pray and ask God's blessing on his word. Father, we have already come before you multiple times tonight. What a privilege. Each of us uh, was dead in our sins, and but your rich mercy, your great love drew us to yourself, opened our eyes to see the beauty of Christ, and that is what I ask. It's what I asked in private earlier today. It's what I ask now before the holy God that you would open the eyes of our heart that we may behold your son Christ, and by beholding be changed. We believe in the Holy Spirit, and it's in his power. In the name of your son, we pray. Amen. Last week, we were in London, and we uh, went on this pretty fantastic church history tour with a group called Christian Heritage. And the tour guide, Ben Virgo, took us to uh, St. Mary's of Albany, where John Newton preached. And he shepherded there, and he was very influential in the life of William Wilberforce, who helped to end slavery, and, but he wasn't always that way. And he told us the story of John Newton before Christ. And he says there was a night um, as they were out on sea, and there was a, a slave woman with a baby, about one years old, and the baby would not stop crying. And John Newton's men, with John Newton looking on, said, you better silence that baby or we will. And she's trying to silence the baby, and the baby uh, would, kept crying. So they ended up taking the baby, and they threw the baby over the ship. And John Newton tells this story um, because he was later so grieved by his sin. And he wrote the song that you all know, um, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And as we were hearing these stories of John Newton, it is easy to think um, there is a wickedness that is greater than my own, 
And the reality is no. And we'll see that today in Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2. So if you're not there, open your Bibles. We'll be looking at verses 1 through 10. And tonight we're going to look at the contrast between man's inability to please God and God's generosity towards sinful man so that you might joyfully walk in the good works he has prepared for you. So man's inability and God's generosity. Give you a little context. So we are in chapter 2. And what's amazing is that Paul doesn't give any indicative or any imperative of an action or a command until chapter 4. And this is really critical because often we want, give me what to do in the Christian life, right? Just tell me what to do so I know that I'm a good Christian. And Paul very purposefully plants the soil of obedience in the gospel in chapters 1, 2, and 3. And he does that because if you're going to be a Christian that bears long and lasting fruit, you cannot forget the gospel. You must rest in the gospel, revel in the gospel, and enjoy the gospel. And that's what we have in really stark contrast today. Let's look at man's inability in verses 1 through 3. He starts in verse 1 and he says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you once walked. Does Paul say, and you were a little sick in your sins? You were, you were a, little, a little off, just slightly off the mark. We just needed to top you up. Maybe a, a good vitamin, a, a cup of tea will we'll get you over the edge. No, you were dead. You were lifeless. Dead people cannot please God. And to add gravity to our sin, it was an active sin and not a passive sin. Paul says, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind, like a buzzard to the carrion, like a pig to the mud, and like a stallion to its wild field, you and I loved our sin. We loved it. And if God had not shown the initiative, he had not stepped into our lives, we would still be dead in our sins. Perhaps now you remember your life before Christ. And you remember that your affections were bent on yourself. You remember your anger. You remember your impatience. You remember your lust. Perhaps it was pornography. But ultimately, you remember, as I do, that I wanted, there was one throne on my heart, and I wanted to sit on that throne. Right? And, and we look back on that life, and you should, like, what gift were we getting from the things of which we are now ashamed? as Romans says. Though God is holy, righteous, and good, you spurned him, you rejected him, you suppressed the truth in unrighteousness, and you went on your own path. And if God had left you to yourself, you would continue to be there. And yet there are these two words in verse 4 that are two of the most beautiful words in Scripture. What do we see there? But God, but God, not but you, not but your intelligence, not that you reasoned your way to him, but God, who's rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us. What motivated God? It was this rich mercy. He is love itself, and it is a great love. It is not a miserly love. Two weeks ago, as we were in Spain, we had three days where we um, went down to Granada, and in Granada, there is this 12th century fortress called the Alhambra. It is fantastic, 
and it's well preserved. But what is, one thing that they did in the 13th century was they, through some ingenious hydraulics and engineering, they were able to get water from about a mile away and pump it up to this fortress that's on the hill that gets to about 45, 47 degrees Celsius in the summer. It's blistering hot. And what's amazing is as you walk through this fortress is there's water everywhere. It is abundant. It's flowing in streams. My girls would make these little walnut streams and, and float them. That was their highlight, not all these other fancy things. Just, I, we've got to float walnut boats. But there's so much water. It is flowing down the path. There's fountains pouring out. You can fill your water bottles. There's this one fountain with, with uh, lions around it that usually has water just pouring out of it. And that's the picture of God's mercy and love. And perhaps some of you tonight have forgotten that God loves you. And it is basic, but it is easy to forget as you are obeying God, as you are seeking to please him, that you forget that God is great in mercy and great in his love for you. He is a father, and perhaps you have a father or had a father that did not demonstrate great mercy and great love. And that can color your view of Almighty God. And what I would encourage you tonight is, is remember that the truth of God's word says that he is rich in mercy and he is great in love. And he cannot love you more and he will not love you less. That promise is the nuclear reactor of your obedience in the Christian life, right? That's the, the lasting joy that will enable you to walk in the good works of verse 10. And if you question, you think perhaps, I have, I've, I've struggled, I've, I've failed, God cannot love me now. Well, Paul reminds you, when did God first love you? You see that there. But God, being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, verse 5, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. And you see the, that pattern that he unpacked in verses 1 through 3, right? That there is this active walking in your sin. There was a um, a following this whole stream of debauched living, the course of this world, that, that you've, you've followed, you bowed the knee to the prince of the power of this air, the spirit that is now, that, that even now we see working in the sons of disobedience. And if God loved you at your worst, will he not sustain you now? Is his love, does it falter with your disobedience? No. The infinite God does not falter in his love. And he reminds us at the end of five there, by grace you have been saved. Mercy is holding back the dam of God's wrath, right? It is, it is keeping back the wrath that you so richly deserved, and then it is redirecting it upon his son. And when he said, my, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It is because God poured his wrath on his son. That Jesus took all the wrath that you and I deserved. And at the end he said, it is finished. There is no drop left in the cup of God's wrath for you to drink. It is finished. That's what mercy is. And then he didn't just leave us there with justification when you believe upon Christ he gives us grace, right? By grace, you have been saved, and grace gives what you and I do not deserve, which is Christ. And he raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I love this, this language. It's all through Ephesians, this in Christ language, with Christ language. Paul uses it over 35 times. And there's this kid's book uh, that talks about this, uh, this filthy peasant that tries to approach the throne room, and he can't because he has the wrong robes. But then the prince gives him his robes, and it's in Christ that we approach the king. 
and he will not cast you out because you are robed in the righteousness of Christ. I love, too, that Paul says there he raised us with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places. There's, there's this form of language Paul often uses where something is so certain in the future that it's as if it's already happened. You and I, we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are physically not there now, but our place is secure. He has your name on the seat reserved, and no one can remove that name. There is a uh, verse or a song we're going to sing at the end um, called His Mercy is More. And it's a newer song. It's written by Matt Boswell. And it was inspired when Matt was reading a letter written by Newton to a woman in this congregation who was discouraged because of her sin. And I wanted to read this to you. It's a, um, it's a shorter letter, but it it tells you where he got the song from, but it also shows you the heart of a pastor who had experienced amazing grace that we're reading about here. Newton wrote this. I can truly say that I bear you upon my heart and in my prayers. I have rejoiced to see the beginning of a good and gracious work in you. And I have confidence in the Lord Jesus that he will carry it on and complete it and that you will be amongst the number of those who shall sing redeeming love to eternity. Therefore, fear none of the things appointed for you to suffer by the way, but gird up the loins of your mind and hope to the end. Be not impatient, but wait humbly upon the Lord. You have one hard lesson to learn. That is the evil of your own heart. You know something of it, but it is needful that you should know more. For the more we know of ourselves, the more we shall prize and love Jesus and his salvation. I hope that you find in yourself by daily experience what you find will humble you, but not discourage you. Humble you it should, and I believe it does. Are you not amazed sometimes that you should have so much as a hope that poor and needy as you are, the Lord thinketh of you? But let not all you feel discourage you. For if our physician is almighty, our disease cannot be desperate. And if he casts none out that come to him, why should you fear? And here's the section. Our sins are many, but his mercies are more. Our sins are great, but his righteousness is greater. We are weak, but he is power. Most of our complaints are owing to unbelief and the remainder of a legal spirit, and these evils are not removed in a day. Wait on the Lord, and he will enable you to see more and more of the power and grace of our high priest. The more you know of him, the better you will trust him. The more you trust him, the better you will love him. The more you love him, the better you will serve him. This is God's way. You are not called to buy, but to beg. Not to be strong in yourself, but in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He is teaching you these things, and I trust he will teach you to the end. Remember, the growth of a believer is not like a mushroom, but like an oak, which increases slowly indeed, but surely. Many suns, showers, and frosts pass upon it before it comes to perfection. And in winter, when it seems dead, it is gathering strength at the root. Be humble, watchful, and diligent in the means, and endeavor to look through all and fix your eye upon Jesus, and all shall be well. I commend you to the care of the Good Shepherd and remain for his sake, yours, John Newton. March 18th, 1767. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And when did God make us alive? Was it when we started to move towards him? Was it when we had already started to obey him, when we had already proven ourselves that, hey, we, we are worth accepting into your family. We are, we're good. You should choose us onto the team. No, he chose us when we were dead in our sins. Verse five, it was in filth, and stench when we were in the midst of our debauchery, God grabbed us 
and plucked us out of the mire. He placed in us a new heart. He gave us faith to believe the truth, to love his son. And not only did God make us alive with Christ, but see how his active mercy continued after making us alive in verse 5. What do we see there? And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Just think. Many of you are burdened today by the sins of yourself or the people around you. Well, in that day, there will be no more sin. We will be with Christ in heaven. And the sin that you so hate, that burdens you now, will be gone. And you will see clearly. And you will know him as you are known. We will be seated with him in the heavenly places. We will enjoy the Messiah. It must shock Satan, the accuser, when he comes before the Father, as we see in Job, to accuse the brethren, and he sees us seated with Christ. Imagine the horror and the anger as he thought he was victorious, right? When he, he bruised, he bruised the sun, and the sun crushed the serpent. He seats us with him in the heavenly places. That's a powerful phrase. Servants stand. Enemies, enemies kneel with the foot of the king upon their necks. But sons sit. Sons sit. We are seated with Christ. Paul opened his letter in Ephesians with a thesis of God's grace and the majesty of it being a motive. And this explains the why. Why Why does God do all that he does? To the praise of his glorious grace. So in Ephesians 1, 5 through 6, it says, In love he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will to the praise of his glorious grace. And we see here in verse 7, so that in the coming ages he might show what? the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. When Solomon began to build his wealth, it was so great, many of you have read this, where at a certain point they stopped counting the wealth. The silver became as the stones, right? That's, that's the same kind of imagery when it says immeasurable riches. You, you cannot measure the riches of God's grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. That's the second time we've seen riches, right? The riches of his mercy, and now the riches of his grace. God is not a miser. He's not a miser. I, in college, I was, I was very involved in ministry. On, on Fridays, we'd go give tacos and share the gospel down in Skid Row in L.A., we, we had Bible studies and ministries, and I was studying a lot. And at a certain point, I was near burnout. And I read this book called The Cross-Centered Life by C.G. Mahaney. And I remember one of his opening phrases. Is he says, Christians often think the gospel is one class in, in the school of faith. It's like Christianity 101. I was dead, and I was made alive in Christ. Now I'm going to move on to the really hard stuff. And he says the gospel is the entire schoolroom in which every other class takes place. The gospel is the foundation. And often, after being justified and after being adopted, we often want to smuggle in our good works into what Christ has already done, right? And and it feels feels almost like a sin to rest upon the work of Christ. 
right? No, surely God must want me now to prove to him my love for him. And it's almost like we, we leave the warmth of the fire of the gospel and we find ourselves getting hypothermia out in the wild trying to please or re-earn what God has already accomplished in Christ. And what I love about Ephesians 1, 2, and 3 is Paul is bringing us back to that fire. He says, the winds are great out there, as we hear now, right? It is, it is bitter cold, but the gospel is what warms you and fuels you. And the sweetness of it carries you to the day you die. For by grace you have been saved. Look at that in verse, verse 8. Part of the reason I, I actually asked Hugh to preach a longer passage today is often we read this verse in isolation. But when you read it in context, I think it gives a richness to it. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is a gift given by God. And why is that? Because if you could earn it, what would we do? We would boast. We would boast. Because we long for glory, and the giver gets the glory. The giver gets the glory. And God says, I will not give my glory to another. So he gives it. He gives it as a gift. There's this powerful passage in Romans 4 where he's, he's addressing the, the tendency to want to have workspace righteousness, right? And he, he calls back, or refers back to Abraham, and he says, at what point was Abraham declared righteous? Was it before or after he was circumcised? And he says it was, it was before. So that, the glory was given as a gift from God. The giver gets the glory. If we could earn our salvation, we would, we would try, and, and many of us did before we got saved. I was born into a Christian home, and I thought I was a good person. At 13, family said we're moving to the Philippines to be missionaries. And I was like, I do not feel called by God. My dad said we're moving anyways. And we ended up in the Philippines, and I suddenly realized in high school after being suspended and going through a number of difficult things that I was not saved, that I tried to be a good person, and that it was the work of Christ that saves me and not my own good works. It is a gift of God. But is there no place for good works? There was a, a complaint against Paul that he taught antinomianism, that if you teach this kind of abundant, free, rich mercy, that you would lead to a people who live whatever kind of life they want to live because they say, if his mercy is more, if grace abounds, why not sin? And yet, if you properly believe the gospel and understand the gospel, you will walk in good works joyfully, not as a burden, as he was preaching this morning. Look there in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. That we should walk in them. God's generosity is seen in not just that he saves us, but that he invites us to participate in his grand plan of redemption from Genesis to Revelation. Because you think about it, God could have done it many different ways. And yet, why would he choose sinners broken like us to do good works? And we go back to verse 7. 
so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace, right? In this room alone, there are trophies of his grace. We could spend days probably retelling of individual instances and, and, and grand themes of God's faithfulness through, through lost children or parents or sickness or hopes deferred. Each of us could point to a good God that has navigated us through this life and good works that he's prepared for you to walk in. I love this, this word workmanship. It, it's this, this um, gives this idea of a, a worker, this intimate craftsmanship that God actively shapes each one of us for his purposes. Again, we see that language of created in Christ Jesus, right? That our, our beginning, the middle, and the end of our life is rooted in Christ Jesus. And then there's the purpose for good works. And then you ask, when did God prepare these? It was beforehand. So God, even before you responded in faith to the gospel, thought of you by name, knew how he would reveal the gospel to you. He knew the, the sin that he would cover with the blood of his son. He knew the sin you commit tomorrow, day after, till the day you die. He says, I love that person. I love them. I've chosen them. I not only chose them to be my child, is I've handcrafted some good works for this person to walk in. You don't stumble about in darkness to like make up your own good works. God has prepared good works for you to do. And as we, as we close out this message, I wanted to, by way of application, Think of some of these good works. And, and what's interesting is as I begin to think about it, often when we, when we think of this passage, we'll start to think of things that are really easily labeled ministry, right? Like that's the good work. And yet, as you read through Ephesians 4, 5, and 6, it begins in the home and in your heart, right? So Ephesians 4, walk in a manner worthy of the gospel, to which you've been called. And I, the Lord put a burden on my heart to read one section of Ephesians 4 by way of application as it flows out of this soil, right? Once you understand the gospel, what should your life look like? Ephesians chapter 4, verses 25 through 32. Therefore, having put away falsehood, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger and give no opportunity to the devil. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Listen to this. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion that it may give grace to those who hear. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God, by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you, along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. That last verse, 32, I would just ask you to ponder, and in a minute I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to leave a moment of silence, that you would ask the Lord, Father, I love your son. Would you show me in my heart perhaps some bitterness, a lack of forgiveness, either to my spouse 
my child, a friend, a neighbor, an in-law, a family member. Because what the gospel does is it transforms us from the inside out. It transforms us. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And the question is, there could be a bitterness in your heart that you've held for a very long time. And I've seen this. I've seen this in my small group that I shepherd. I've seen this in my own heart. And often it starts really subtly, maybe a slight, maybe a word, maybe a, a, a misunderstood or maybe a properly understood um, offense. And then it grows and it, it takes root. And then it starts to kind of find its own place in the garden of your heart, right? And you kind of start to build a, a little fence around it that protects this bitterness. And you think about it and you nurse it. And over time, it will rob you of joy. And so I would just ask you, is there any sin that anyone has committed against you that is greater than the sin that you've committed against Christ Jesus? And the answer is no. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And I would say, if you and I properly understand your inability to choose God, to love God in your own strength, God's generosity to redeem you in Christ, to give you his son, then it will transform your life, beginning in your own heart and how you love those closest to you. So I'm going to pray for us, and I'm going to leave a moment of about a minute of quiet, and then we will sing um, his mercy is more. Father, even now, I thank you for your word. Lord, I thank you for your son, Jesus. Our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. And as we seek on this Sunday evening now to let the word apply, may we not shy away from your convicting spirit. Show us now, Father, where we have clung just like the unforgiving spirit, uh, servant in Matthew 18 after they had been forgiven millions and millions let us not be like them who go and strangle somebody who's offended us show us now father What love could remember, no wrongs we have done. Omniscient, all-knowing, he counts not their sum. Thrown into a sea without bottom or shore, our sins, they are many. His mercy is more. Amen.